17, 2018 <coughs> City Council meeting. Let the record reflect that all <coughs> City Council members are present and officials are present. Please stand firstly for an invocation and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet here today to perform our appointed tasks, we invoke your guidance and blessings on all that we do here. We ask that you guide those here, our elected officials, to reach their decisions in a fair and equitable manner for all. Let them always be aware that they serve the people of this city. Let us, as citizens, assist them as we may to govern and ask in a manner acceptable to you. We also ask your guidance and blessings on those of the city staff in all that they do, realizing that they also serve the citizens of our city, many times in untold, unrecognized ways that are necessary to our well-being. All these things we pray. Amen. 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 I and justice for all. Thank you, John. You're welcome. <clears throat> this morning we have a couple of very special proclamations, the first of which is CARE that Council Member Prafke will present. Good morning. Thank you. I'm very honored to do this as a former CARE board member. Uh, proclamation, City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas the Center for Abuse and Rape Emergencies, Inc. of Charlotte County's um, CARE, C-A-R-E, Mission is to create safety in our community by helping survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and other violent crimes, and to promote nonviolent relationships by example and education. And whereas, over the past 35 years, CARE has helped victims of domestic abuse and sexual assault, including care for women, children, and men providing services which include a 24-bed domestic violence shelter, transitional housing, transporta transportation safety planning, hospital response counselors, crisis intervention, court advocacy, crimes compensation assistance, relocation assistance, and 24-hour hotline access. It's a lot. And <clears throat> whereas in 2003, the CARE Auxiliary was organized as a social and fundraising entity whose purpose is to help is to help the kids at CARE. And whereas the CARE Ball is the longest running annual so social fundraising event in Charlotte County and has been voted <coughs> best fundraising gala by Harbor Style Magazine's Harbor's Hottest for the last five of six years. And whereas in partnership with Charlotte County Environmental and Extension Service, CARE created Project Reuse in 2004, a collaborative effort to keep usable items out of the landfill and at the same time augment funding for CARE. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim January 17, 2018 as the Center for Abuse and Rape Emergencies CARE Day passed and duly adopted this 17th day of January 2018. City of Punta Gorda, Florida, signed Rachel Kiesling Mayor. And accepting will be Judy um, <coughs> Harris, the president of the CARE Board. And Judy has a team of people here she'd like to introduce. I do, I do. Um, our executive director is with me, Karen McElhaney, Chris Hall, come, 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 come. Chris Hall is our uh, coordinator for our Green Dot program, so if any of you belong to clubs and organizations, Chris can come out and speak to you about how you can safely get involved. If you see something wrong, you sh can say something. Um, and Allison Birch is with me. She's our secretary for the board. I'm Judy Harris. I'm the uh, executive, excuse me. No, I'm not. I'm the board <coughs> chair. She's the executive director. <laughs> anyway, um, we really so much appreciate this award. Um, our friend and um, 
founder, Paula Hess, couldn't be with us this morning, and that makes me sad because she's the one who deserves to have this more than anybody. She was one of the founders 35 years ago, so CARE has been in the community all this time. We have done our CARE Ball, which is next Saturday, January 27th, for 30 years annually. Even when Hurricane Charlie came to town and blew away the old event center, we pitched a tent and we had a circus theme. So nothing ever gets us down. So um, I just wanna say thank you again. Um, we so appreciate this. I'd invite you to come next Saturday, but we are sold out for the first time in our history. 740 people are coming. So. So I thank you, we are, I, I'm gonna say it out, no, I'm not gonna say it. We're doing something very special at the ball and donations will be accepted at any time. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Hands Across the Harbor Day that Council Member Matthews will present. Yes, thank you, it's my pleasure <clears throat> to do this. Um, Howard, are you going to sing? Okay. Howard wants to sing the Hands Across the Harbor song. This is a proclamation of the city of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas the city council and the citizens of Punta Gorda have demonstrated support for events promoting wellness and good health, and whereas the Hands Across the Harbor event was launched in 2009 by the Charlotte Harbor and Punta Gorda Community Redevelopment Agencies <coughs> to build community partnerships <coughs> while promoting area parks and businesses, and whereas the event has evolved over the years to create legacy sponsors and now includes the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center as the recipient partner, and whereas the Hands Across the Harbor 5K Run Bridge Half Marathon Walk, Bike Ride, and Long Board Race events provide an opportunity for all ages to participate in physical activity while enjoying the beautiful vistas of Charlotte Harbor, and whereas the 10th annual Hands Across the Harbor is scheduled for January 27, 2018, starting at Bayshore Live Oak Park, crossing the US 41 southbound bridge into the city of Punta Gorda, along the waterfront of Lashley Park, Gilchrist Park, Ponce de Leon Park, and finishing at Bayshore Live Oak Park. Now therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda does hereby proclaim that Jan January 27, 2018 shall be known as Hands Across the Harbor Day and encourages residents and others to participate in the many activities scheduled during this exciting event. Passed and duly adopted in regular session this 17th day of January 2018, City of Punta Gorda, Florida, Rachel Kiesling, Mayor, and accepting will be Doris Button, who is the CEO of CHECK. <coughs> This is the uh, theme song for Hands Across the Harbor. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations so much. Hands across the harbor. No, 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 no. Hands across the sea. Order. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Jack has been very grateful to be on the receiving end of this gift for the last past 10 years. The committee, thank you to the CRAs, the committee for all the work they've done, the hours they've put in. We're very grateful. Thank you all so much. Thank you. So you can run your half marathon, get cleaned up, and go to the care ball that night. That's a pretty exciting, pretty exciting day. Uh, next, we have a very special proclamation, Stephen M. Fabian Jr. Day, which Vice Mayor Wine will present. Um, I am honored and humbled and with a, a hole in my heart to offer this proclamation. Whereas Stephen M. Fabian Jr. was born in wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania in 1928. He valiantly joined the United States Army in 1945 during World War II. Then in 1949 began his career with Honeywell, which spanned 30 years. While at Honeywell, he obtained his degree in management engineering from Hofstra University. He subsequently retired from Link, a company located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in 1987 and moved to Punta Gorda. And whereas Steve served as city council member from February 2000 to November 2006 and was the city's mayor from 2003 
until his retirement from city council in 2006, and whereas he also served on the Punta Gorda Housing Authority, Punta Gorda Isles Canal Advisory Committee and Utility Advisory Board. He was the longest serving volunteer for the Punta Gorda Police Department with more than 20 years of participation with the Marine Unit and volunteer and policing programs. And whereas Steve was a master instructor of the local Coast Guard Auxiliary Unit, volunteered with SCORE, was a Punta Gorda Isles Civic Association Computer Club instructor, and was an active member of several other businesses and community organizations, such as the Ponce de Leon Conquistadors. He devoted his life to his family, his community, his church, and to helping others. And whereas a celebration of life will be held on Friday, January 19th, 2018, at 11 a.m. at the Sacred Heart Catholic Church to remember him. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does there hereby proclaim January 19th, 2018, as Stephen M. Fabian, Jr. Day, passed and duly adopted in regular session the 17th day of January 2018, signed Rachel Keesling, Mayor, and accepting will be Lindsay. If, if I may, uh, uh, with me today is uh, several conquistadors. I have Fig Newton with me, and Mike Comrie, who's vice president, is in, in, in the crowd someplace. But, uh, I see him our, waving. Pardon me? He's outside the he's door. Outside I see him waving. waving. There yeah. he is, w waving a hand in the very back. Uh, we'd like to thank the city council uh, and city staff uh, for their efforts uh, put forth to uh, make this day uh, a special for the Steve Fabian family. Uh, as you may, as you all realize, and some do directly and indirectly, Steve was a very involved person within our community, uh, very deeply devoted to whatever he did. Uh, quite committed, as I st have stated, and protective uh, with the conquistadors. Uh, he was involved with communications for a long time and also was our uh, longstanding cannoneer uh, for our organization. And, uh, Believe me, if you tried to take over the cannon, uh, you had to go through him, over him, around him, whatever. But Steve was very protective of that. He, he was the conquistador in the full regalia with, ear, with protective hearing uh, devices over his ears. So he looked quite odd uh, when he was in parades. Uh, I will recount one situation. Uh, Christmas holiday season here in Florida is quite uh, spectacular. We have a lot of Christmas parades and all and uh, conquistadors have been participating in those for many, many years, one of which was in Venice, Florida, uh, several years ago. And if you know Venice, you have to weave through the side streets to get into position for being the parade. And as we're going down the side street where hundreds of cars are parked outside the main venue there in downtown Venice, all these cars are parked and someone said, for Steve to shoot the cannon off. So he shot the cannon off, and what he did is he set off the car alarms on that street. <laughs> <laughs> and so as we left the street, you were hearing this background noise of car alarms going off, and, and uh, little do we realize the percussion of that device, and, and later on we started getting uh, shorter loads for our cannon. But anyway, on behalf of Steve and the family, we want to again thank the city and everyone for all they've done. Uh, as stated, Steve is a very special person. We're missing him already, and, and God bless everyone for, for supporting him and, and the family, and thank you. Thank today. you. He left. Oh, he did? Okay. This would be the time if you would like to uh, introduce yourself as a board or committee member. Jen, I'm not sure if anybody's out there that can't make their way through the door, but if they want to introduce themselves for a board or committee, now would be the time. Does anybody have their name in the running for a board or committee and they would like to introduce themselves? No. Okay. Seeing none, we will move into our regular agenda and we do not have any public hearings, but we do have two quasi-judicial. So um, if you want to go through a little... Well, first of all, anyone who is going to be presenting any evidence or testimony, or even if you think you might want to present some evidence or testimony with respect to these two quasi-judicial items, please rise to be sworn by the city clerk at this time. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in today's proceedings? I do. 
When you come um, to the uh, podium to speak, please state your name and indicate you've been sworn. Thank you. The um, first item on the agenda <coughs> is SE-04-16. It's a request by Robert H. Burson, agent on behalf of Vent LLC, Vivanti at Punta Gorda Property Owners Association, Inc., Palm Islands Con Condominium Development, LLC, and PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association, Inc., jointly as owners for a special exception pursuant to Chapter 26, Section 16.8, Punta Gorda Code, to construct docking facilities with up to 255 private dock slips for the sole use of the residents of the Vivanti development to permit 41 public docking boat slips for properties along Colony Point Drive with lake frontage for a total of <coughs> 296 private dock slips to create a navigable channel connecting the Peace River through a vacant common area on the north end of the development and to install a seawall along the lands abutting the proposed channel. Since none of these activities are considered permitted uses or structures, but may be approved as a special exception. Thank you. So let me just read this procedures for public comments, because this is a quasi-judicial hearing, just so everybody's on the same page. Procedures for public comments. City staff and the applicant, and also the interveners, will be allowed 30 minutes each to provide a formal presentation. After the formal presentations, the public comment period will begin. Each person will have three minutes to speak. Sharing minutes is not permitted. Form an orderly line at this, this podium over here and be ready to approach the podium when it is your turn. After you approach the microphone, state your name if you want to your address and that you have been sworn. The mayor will signal when you should begin. Speakers will address all comments to the council as a whole and not to any one individual or to any member of the audience. Discussion between speakers and the members of the audience is not allowed. If you are reiterating another speaker's comments, please acknowledge that and add only additional content. This helps to ensure everyone has a chance to speak. Audience and speakers will be courteous in their language and presentation. No applause before, during, or after each speaker. If you have supporting documents to display during the meeting, you must provide a copy to the city clerk. Council members will not be answering impromptu questions during the public comment period. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. And we do have a lighting system over there and a timer. So it is green, then it goes to yellow when you have 30 seconds left. And when it turns red, you have the buzzer and you need to wrap it up. So we do have a system in place for your three minutes. And just before we hear from staff, I have one other sort of informational um, piece to, to, to provide to you. There are two hearings with respect to this subject matter. The first is the special exception, which is going to go first. This is um, a provision in the zoning code that allows for a use um, of the land, uh, which will include, ultimately, if approved, docking facilities. The second item on our agenda relating to this matter is a special permit hearing, which will follow the special exception hearing. This, spe this special permit hearing actually considers the design, location, and construction of the docking facility itself. So two separate hearings, two separate um, uh, burdens of proof and, and criteria that needs to be considered. The first one you'll be hearing is with respect to the use of the property. That's the special exception hearing that begins now. Good morning, Lisa Hannon, zoning official for the record, and I have been sworn. This uh, summary of the applicant's request is the applicant has submitted a request to create a navigable channel connecting to the Peace River through vacant common area on the north end of the Vivante development and to install a seawall along the lands abutting the proposed channel. In addition, the applicant has requested to construct 255 private dock slips for the sole use of the resident owners of Vivante. The application is in order and has been filed properly. The proposed use will not adversely affect the use of neighboring properties. With the design of the proposed navigable channel, the closest edge of the, edge of the channel being at least 114 to 116 feet waterward, waterward of the existing shoreline and condominiums, the boat traffic should have no negative impact on the existing conditions in this boating community. The proposed use will not adversely affect the use of neighboring properties. Additional permitting through all appropriate federal and state agencies, including but not limited to 
Army Corps of Engineers, Southwest Florida Water Management, Florida Department of Environmental Protection is required prior to construction. The per permitting process is ongoing and the full responsibility of the applicant. The agencies will ensure all environmental and marine life concerns are properly addressed. Concern was raised that the lake is a city owned lake. The city does not and never has owned the lake. The lake is owned and maintained by the PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association per restrictive covenants recorded in 1984 by Punta Gorda Isles Incorporated. Concern has also been raised regarding legal ownership and authorization to submit the special exception application. It is the city's duty to accept the application containing the appropriate sworn statements on page 404 of the application at face value. Only the circuit court has the authority to adjudicate the contentions raised. The granting of the special exception will not result in any determination of legal rights between the properties. This is a private legal matter as far as the city is concerned. Criteria number two. The use shall comply with the applicable district regulations and the applicable provisions of the adopted comprehensive plan and downtown plans. The proposed use has no impact on the downtown plan and is consistent with the City of Punta Gorda comprehensive plan specifically. Object objective 2B.1.1. Punta Gorda will continue a development pattern which is characterized by the location of water dependent and water related uses in waterfront areas. Policy 2B.1.1.1. Structures and uses in waterways, waterward of the ma main high water line or bulk headline will be limited to water oriented uses and structures which provide, which support water oriented uses and such uses and structures may be further regulated or restricted depending upon adjacent upland land uses consistent with the comprehensive plan and zoning. Policy 2B.1.1.2. Punta Gorda's waterfront will be characterized by water dependent uses, example given boat ramps, marinas, dock facilities, fishing piers, etc., and by other water related uses such as waterfront parks, boardwalks, hotels, shopping and restaurant uses, waterfront residential uses, etc. Policy 2B.1.1.3. The siting of boating related facilities in Punta Gorda will be consistent with the comprehensive plan and land development regulations and will incorporate developmental and environmental criteria, vacant adjoining parcels, acreage, land use, land site infrastructure, water sewer road, aquatic preserve, wetland seagrass, water depth adjacent to parcel and boat access. Goal 2B.3, public access to promote the city of Punta Gorda as a boater's destination by enhancing public access between the land and the waters of the state of Florida for all residents and visitors of the city of Punta Gorda based upon current and projected demand. Objective 2B.3.1, improve access from the waters of the Peace River and the Charlotte Harbor to the city of Punta Gorda by improving the number and quality of boat slips, moorings, and shoreside support facilities for cruising boaters. Policy 2B.3.1.1. The city shall promote joint ventures, development or redevelopment of projects which support design standards that promote or improve public access from the Peace River to the city. Goal 2B.6. Enhancement of the viable traditional economy to enhance economic development opportunities within the city of Punta Gorda that more fully connects the community to its waterfront. Objective 2B.6.1, the city shall maintain and enhance its traditional economy in the areas of boating, fishing, and tourism. And policy 2B.6.1.1, the city shall promote sport fishing events and other similar activities. <coughs> Criteria number three, the location, size, and height of buildings, structures, walls, fences, and the nature and extent of screening, buffering, and landscaping shall be such that the use will not hinder or discourage the appropriate development and use of the adjacent or nearby land and or buildings. No new buildings are proposed on the site. The proposed docks are in the water and are consistent with the surrounding neighbors, neighborhoods and other waterways. 
The proposed navigable channel will allow boat traffic to access the harbor directly and will not impact boat traffic and other existing canals. The maintenance of the lake, seawalls, and channel will remain the responsibility of the property owners abutting the lake. This was denoted in the original covenants and restrictions for the PGI Section 24, which were recorded in 1984. Per the applicant, a jetty is no longer being proposed. Environmental lake and water quality concerns have been raised and will be addressed by the applicant based on the scientific environmental studies done of the area. The proposed use, criteria number four, I'm sorry, the proposed use will be such that pedestrian and vehicular traffic generated will not be hazardous or conflict with the existing and anticipated traffic of the neighborhood and on existing and on the street serving the site. The proposed channel is approximately 116 feet waterward and away from the existing shoreline of the Colony Point Drive and the existing condominiums. The community, by its very nature, is a boating community, and seeing boating traffic is commonplace. No additional pedestrian or vehicular traffic will be generated as a result of this request. Staff has heard concerns raised of a boat superhighway that would be created. For those that live on Tarpon Inlet, there are approximately 200 lots on the north side of the bridge, not counting any boat slips at the Colony Point Condominium. The existing conditions at Tarpon Inlet are similar to what would be created at the proposed inlet. Given these similarities, staff does not foresee any issues with a boat superhighway being created. There are no additional findings, so I'll go into our conclusions. The lake ownership and control was granted by restrictive covenants for PGI Section 24. On page 5 of the restrictive covenants for the Punta Gorda Isle Section 24, recorded February 15, 1984, all lots and condominium units which may be built upon the lands immediately adjacent to the lake shall have an undivided interest in all of the lake, which interest shall be equivalent to the owner's obligation to pay maintenance thereon as set, for, as set forth hereafter. PGI <coughs> Section 24 is not part of the PGI Canal Maintenance District, and therefore the district would not be responsible for any cost associated with the lake or the seawalls. Additionally, the covenant state, quote, nothing shall prohibit the association or the majority of the adjacent unit owners from seeking an outlet from the lake to the harbor, end quote. This was clearly contemplated in 1984 when PGI Section 24 covenants were recorded. The request complies with the policy goals and objectives of the city's adopted comprehensive plan. The request meets the required criteria and the application is in order. Special exception approval is valid for a period of two years after the date of the approval by the City Council unless a permit or occupancy permit has been issued for the use if required. Staff recommended conditions of approval. Staff recommends approval with the following conditions. Condition number one. The city, by way of its special exception approval, expressly prohibits the lease or sale of the slips within the Vivante Boat Basin to anyone but a member of the PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association Incorporated, owner or resident. Violation of this condition is a violation of Chapter 26, Article 3.5, Parent B, Parent 3, which states in part, owners or occupants of the adjacent upland property may not rent docks to be used by third parties. <clears throat> Condition number two, the PGI Section 24 Properties Property Owners Association Incorporated restrictive covenants be amended to include the restriction that when the docks are constructed in the Vivante Boat Basin, the docks can only be sold or leased to a member of the PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association Incorporated and will be for the sole use of the member or resident only. Condition number three. The approval of the private boat slips within the Vivante Basin is subject to the approval of the Canal Construction Special Permit application. If approved, all docks will require a separate permit through Building and or Engineering Division prior to construction. Condition number four, the private boat slips along the undeveloped multifamily lots cannot be constructed until the property is developed and a certificate of occupancy has been issued. Condition number five, boat slips for individual properties abutting the lake along Colony Point will require separate permits through the Building and or Engineering Division prior to installation. Condition number six, 
Additional permitting through all appropriate federal and state agencies, including but not limited to Army Corps of Engineers, Southwest Florida Water Management, Florida Department of Environmental Protection is necessary and the permitting process is ongoing and the full responsibility of the applicant. Staff recommendations based on the aforementioned approval criteria, findings and conclusions. Urban Design Division recommends approval of the special exception request to create a navigable channel connecting to the Peace River through the vacant common area on the north end of the Vivante development and to install a seawall along the lands abutting the proposed channel based upon the above conditions. This recommendation of approval does not include the canal construction special permit request for the docks. The canal construction special permit is a separate request to be considered by City Council this date. The Punta Gorda Development Review Committee recommended moving the request forward to Planning Commission and City Council, and the Punta Gorda Planning Commission recommended approval of the request. Lisa, I may have missed it, but for the record, would you again state your name, your position, and whether or not you've been sworn? Yes, Lisa Hannon, zoning official, and I have been sworn. All right, and would you now officially and formally submit your staff report and recommendation to the record? I would like to submit that formally into the record. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to hear from the applicant. Yes. And they have 30 minutes to present their <coughs> presentation. Good morning, <clears throat> Rob Bernson, Big W Law Firm, here on behalf of the applicants. I was gonna sing part of my presentation, but after hearing Howard, I figured uh, I had <laughs> too much competition there. Um, one other matter, Mr. Levin, um, right. I would like, um, Ms. Hannon to be considered an expert uh, for purposes of presenting her testimony. The um, city council has the authority to recognize uh, any of the um, witnesses uh, as experts. Um, you're familiar, uh, well, Lisa, would you just kind of give a very brief overview of your um, experience in planning and your background? Well, I've worked for the city for four, almost 14 years. I've been in the planning and zoning um, division for 12 years. I worked under the former zoning official as zoning coordinator and her assistant for those 12 years and assisted in writing staff reports and doing the research for such staff reports. Um, does the city council consider Lisa Hammond to be an expert in, uh, in, in planning and uh, development? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So be it. Thank you very much. Again, Rob Bernson, I have been sworn in. Uh, we are here on this special exception application request uh, for the Vivante project, cut through as we've all called it um, over the years. I have two uh, expert witnesses here with me that are gonna present testimony um, regarding this application. We join in the staff report and the findings contained therein. Uh, that staff report indicates that we meet all the criteria for the granting of a special exception. And again, we join in that finding as well. I'm gonna have my experts uh, present their testimony and then I will uh, conclude at the end of that. So at this time, I'd like to call ha Hans Wilson to the podium. This is Yes, for the record, my name is Hans Wilson. I'm a licensed professional engineer. I've been doing waterfront design, permitting facilities for 30 plus years in Southwest Florida, in the state of Florida. And um, I've been working on uh, this project for the better part of 22 years, beginning with the first project back in the 90s. What I'm going to do is overview how we got to where we are today in part for those in the audience that have not seen some of the history of the location and for some of the new council members. And let's see here. Okay. Um, PGI Section 24 Property Owners Association, VENT LLC, Vivanti Punta Gorda Condo Association have basically joined together to seek the special exception to create an access channel into Charlotte Harbor and the Peace River and with that, submit for the special permit for the docks that go with that particular development. And obviously the reason for doing this is to enhance the recreational value for the residents. And in doing so, that would increase tax base for the city. It relieves some of the load on other infrastructure that is publicly owned, for example, boat ramps and public marina facilities, 
where otherwise those residents might be occupying space today. And uh, I have gone through and reviewed the past permitting design efforts for this waterway and done quite a few pre-application meetings with the local, state, and federal agencies. A little bit of history, and I'll try to go through this quickly. As late as 1951, much of Punta Gorda was undeveloped, and I want to draw your attention to these areas up here. This is the dredge canal and channel, tarpon canal. Yes, ma'am. Um, we can't see what you're pointing to because we're look facing you. Okay, so I'll try to describe try to that. <laughs> if you'll Thank you. If you use the, uh, use the cursor, cursor on the computer. Okay. There you go. Uh, the the, uh, okay, we'll, we'll go with the cursor methodology. Thanks. I think I'll do this faster if I just describe to you what you see. The area that you see in the red are the platted properties that are part of the Punta Gorda Isle subdivision. What you see in the yellow on the right-hand side and to the north or the top of the drawing are the dredged areas that created the uh, original uh, channel area. That's okay. <coughs> okay. So this was in 1951. In uh, 1968, much of Punta Gorda Isles development was underway, and part of that was the historic dredging and filling of our wetlands to create uplands. Many of the canal systems were dredged, and that created that fill that created the land. Uh, of particular interest is the very north end where uh, Colony Point development was basically non-existent. It was still part of the Peace River. And then you'll see to the west in red, pretty much the outline of the platter property is associated with the Vivanti development. By 1970, you can see where areas had been dredged, the dredging continued, the Colony Point piece had been created now, so those residents uh, are now living on fill lands that were originally part of the uh, river, and you can see in the upper hand, upper uh, top of the drawing, the yellow outline is the dredged areas that created the navigational access to the Peace River servicing the canals that are on the east side of the drawing, and as yet, Vivanti area had not been developed. The internal lake system by 1974 had been created, and that was where we started getting the upland development uh, um, and land mass that uh, basically supported the Vivanti um, project. And then by 1975, the basic outline of the lake or the basin was completed and was in place as it remains today. And uh, the um, white areas that you see outlined by the red uh, line work are basically the filled areas that were created from mangrove wetlands to create those upland areas. So typical for a lot of Punta Gorda Isles, what were wetlands and mangrove systems are now uplands and condominiums and single family residential developments. In 1994, and that's why I said I go back uh, the better part of 23 years with this project, uh, with another firm, we were involved with consulting with uh, developing this particular property for boating access. And based on the relationship with the uh, aquatic preserve, the environmental conditions that we had, what made the most sense was simply to create an access channel on the eastern side of the basin connecting with Tarpon Canal. And in doing so, the proposal was to redirect traffic from Colony Point Drive to the west side of the Vivanti development to allow for this navigational access to Tarpon Canal. That received some significant objections from residents concerned about the additional travel time involved in getting to their destination, and conversely, the additional time it might take for emergency vehicles to get to their residence in the Colony Point condominium. So that project received a lot of objection, and uh, this was the design uh, at a later date for a bridge that would have basically uh, connected over the top, allowing for the uh, connection to Tarpon Canal, and uh, the problem with that were objections with site distance on the residential properties at each end. So we had some concerns about that particular option. So then the next option that was pursued was essentially creating uh, in 2007 the Boca Lago Boathouse. And in that particular case, what they would be doing is lifting the vessels out of the interior basin, not connecting it necessarily to Tarpon Canal, but transferring it into a, a, an interior connecting canal that boaters could then go underneath this bridge 
uh, and into uh, navigable access to Peace River, Charlotte Harbor. Of course, there were objections with the bridge itself, the height, the view distances, and that project uh, basically uh, was stopped. And this is kind of an oblique view of what that lift structure would look like. On the left-hand side, you could see the boathouse where a fork truck would be basically picking up the vessel, swing it over a, a, a seawall and into an interior canal that connected to Tarpon Canal. And in this particular case, it was very restrictive because of the height of the bridge, really limited the types of boats that could be able to access back and forth. Now this was, from a regulatory standpoint with the state and federal agencies, you know, we were, we were basically going in the direction that still uh, addressed water quality concerns, habitat concerns. This didn't have any resource impacts at all. Uh, however, in, if you go back through a lot of the comments associated with these various alternatives, and, and again, this is the basis for our alternatives analysis with the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, one of the objectors said, well, why don't they just build it like it was originally intended? And that was making the connection to the north through that canal, and that's where we are today. So, and this was kind of a, another view where they had talked about, in fact, instead of building the canal, they were going to actually pick boats up on the basin side or the lake side and with a fork truck carry them across to Tarpon Canal without building the interior canal system. Of course, this involved having some sort of guard gate because we didn't want to have a conflict with vessels being carried across with a fork truck and then cars interfacing with that. So. Uh, again, it was a, another attempt to, uh, uh, to try and secure this boating access uh, that um, was met with some concern for residents. So this is where we are today, the submittal for the special exception. And what you'll see in this drawing are three boxes. The top box called Detail B is essentially the feature of the connecting or the entrance channel. The middle box, uh, which is detail A, is essentially the marina plan, and then detail C in the bottom left-hand corner is the flushing channel connection that we've proposed. And this design uh, is intended to create not just boating access to the Peace River, but also to function as a settling basin for the Peace River because of its ebb-dominant nature. This channel basically would direct a lot of the abdominate flow on that shoreline into that basin, which is extremely deep for this area, 20 feet in many locations. And then that would then continue through to the Tidal Creek in the <coughs> southwest corner of the development and back into Charlotte Harbor. Uh, any suspended sediments associated with discharges coming out of the Peace River would settle out. Uh, this also uh, basin has the potential of being a receiving uh, body for uh, dredge material out of channel maintenance projects. Uh, ultimately, if you can raise, increase the, the depth, in other words, uh, make it shallower as time goes on, you, in, you continue to improve water quality in the basin itself. Uh, and that also, to an extent, addresses a lot of the problems we have with maintenance dredging. If the maintenance dredging materials are of good quality, this is a great location in which to dispose of that material. This is the bathymetry that we collected for the entrance channel. You can see it's very shallow. The areas in orange and yellow are one to two feet in water depth. However, as you move off to the northeast or the upper right-hand corner of the drawing, we connect with the dredged area associated with Tarpon Canal. This was essentially the shortest connecting distance to deep water uh, that allowed us to have that access without uh, having to overly dredge uh, the area. This is a graphic that I put together that answered many of the questions about, well, why don't they just run right out to the river? And the problem with running directly out to the river is that if you take a look at the minus six foot mean lower low water depth contour from the NOAA chart, 11426, that line you see in the upper left hand corner is that minus six foot contour. Everything south or below that line is water that's shallower. So, when we're looking at a location where we would be dredging about 170 linear feet to make the connection with the Tarpon Canal uh, entrance waterway, comparing that to 2,025 feet to get out to deep water in the river, uh, not only is there an excessive amount of dredging involved when you compare the two, there's also resource impacts. So we have to demonstrate to the federal agencies that we are minimizing our resource impacts. This is a detail showing the proposed channel alignment. 
the dimensions. And if you take a look at the cross section DD, which is the bold line with the two initials on it, this just gives you an idea of what that channel would look like once it's dredged. And there's really not much more than explaining that this is the setup that we will be submitting to the agencies. And uh, the one thing I wanna point out that's important is that the, the room that exists between the colony point development and the leading edge of the channel is between 110 feet to 120 feet. What that does is that allows, if colony points should so choose to pursue boat docks on their facility, city code limits them to an extension into the water body of no greater than 80 feet because this is, this is other waters, this is not a platted canal. So essentially, if they, there's room for them to create their boat docks in, in uh, accordance with the city code up to that 80 foot extension. And for them, actually creating this channel would actually create their own navigation channel. Of course, they would have to pursue dredging activities in between the channel and their seawall to harbor those vessels <coughs> or whatever docks they might pursue. But there's no obstruction or complication associated with them pursuing their own permits to create boat docks in that location. So I just think that was important because there was a lot of talk about uh, the channel obstructing the ability for them to create boat slips and the reality is the city code limits them and we're beyond what that city code limit is. This is why we're here today. This is the typical cross section where I was talking about that section DD and of course we would have channel markers on both sides and it's basically a 60 foot wide channel at the bottom. Uh, this would be a, uh, a box cut where we'd have side slopes adjust. And that width dredging to minus six foot mean low water is what we feel is commensurate with allowing for vessels to pass in this channel, having enough room to allow for side set when we have winds blowing from the west or the northwest, the boats move around in the channel. It's just a safe channel width for this particular application. In the southwest corner, we have the proposed flushing channel. What we would be doing is creating a box culvert under uh, the West Marion Drive Road. That box culvert would then connect with an artificially created channel that is north and above the existing mangrove line so that we would not be dredging any mangroves. The only place that we would have any direct mangrove impacts would be basically in the bottom uh, left-hand corner where you see that green looking color. That's where the natural tidal channel uh, uh, has mangroves along the edge that we would have to dredge through to connect. That impact is about 0 .04 acres or about 1,850 square feet. It's not a significant amount of mangroves lost to create this tidal connection. This also enhanced flushing within that tidal creek. Uh, when we set up our tide gauge in this location, the mud and the silt and the organics in there are waist deep. And you can feel hard bottom when you get down through that mud and that silt but having that flushed out would improve significantly the flushing of that entire mangrove system at that location. This is the uh, zoom in of the basin. As I said before, the water depths are 20 foot deep. And this is kind of talking towards the special permit because I don't wanna take your time when we get to the special permit portion of the submittal. I wanna run through it now. So I may go a little bit over, but you can count that time towards what I would have been talking about in the next part. Uh, the water depths in the basin are deep, 20 feet, 24, it's, it's really deep. And the problem with that, that that creates is that it becomes cost prohibitive to create a boat dock similar to, yes, Rob. Hans, I think we'll take the docking portion and hold it to the next hearing. You wanna hold so, on that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, at this time, I would like to offer Mr. Wilson as an expert uh, for the city council in his uh, testimony. Yes. Mm -hmm. Should we do questions? After um, they, yeah. yeah, after. Mm -hmm. You want the first one we did? Any, is there a consensus that is he'll- Is there a consensus? Any objection to offering him as an expert? No. No, no. okay. I, I will note that we have two interveners that have um, formally entered uh, as parties in this proceeding. And after the uh, applicant's presentation, those interveners will be given an opportunity to cross-examine whatever expert witness has been um, presented on behalf of the applicants. At this point, we will have uh, Dan DeLisi testify as an expert uh, from the planning side. You're at the 18 minute mark, so just letting you know. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, for the record, my name is Dan DeLisi. I have been sworn um, just uh, by way of background. Uh, I have 
been a land use planner primarily in Southwest Florida for the last 15 plus years. I have testified in circuit court, in uh, administrative law hearings, uh, and in front of local bodies throughout the state of Florida uh, as an expert witness in, in planning and environmental policy. I'm a former chief of staff at the South Florida Water Management District as well. Um, <clears throat> To uh, honor your, your 30 minute time frame, I'm gonna significantly uh, truncate my presentation. Uh, suffice to say that uh, we agree with Lisa's analysis of the special exception. In the uh, land development code for the city of Punta Gorda, you have four criteria by which you evaluate special exceptions. <coughs> Uh, the second criteria being compliance with the comprehensive plan, and I think in many respects that's, that's one of the most important criteria. The, the city of Punta Gorda, as you all know, is known as a boater's destination. Your comp plan says it. The design of the city, and you could just see from the aerial of this portion of the city, was around trying to enhance boat access to the greatest extent possible. There's a canal system that goes through uh, the city to enhance the boat access and just everything about the city screams of waterfront orientation. Um, the, the one uh, point that I would like to make about uh, boats um, is, you know, when we think of boat slips, sometimes we confuse boat slips with, uh, with cars. You know, if you have 296 boat slips, that's like 296 parking spaces. It's not at all like that, and Hans, uh, you know, I, I think Hans is a good person to testify to this, uh, but those of us who are boat owners, we, we understand that uh, you don't use your boat for daily uh, needs. You don't take your boat to and from a store, you don't take your boat to and from work, you don't use your boat every day. And in fact, most boaters don't use their boats all that much at all, as much as they would like. Um, you know, your, your comp plan, just to exemplify the point, your goal 2B3 says promote the city of Punta Gorda as a boater's destination. I'd be hard pressed to find a comp plan anywhere that says uh, promote a city as a, a car destination. I mean, people don't, your car is a necessity, your boat is for fun. And, and you use your boat when you want to enjoy it, when, you, when the weather permits it, too. So even if you want to go out, sometimes wind is, is too heavy and you can't go out. So the idea that 296 slips is going to create some sort of uh, boat superhighway, as Lisa had mentioned, and she also found that that's just simply not going to be the case, it will not be the case. That, that's not how uh, boat traffic uh, works. And so from, from that standpoint, uh, it's, it's hard to argue that there would be any sort of adverse impacts on surrounding property owners. And in fact, if you look at the surrounding properties, uh, if anything, adding boat access uh, greatly enhances the value and the developability of surrounding properties, uh, which is one of the special exception uh, criteria. Uh, excuse me. So. Um, it's in compliance with the comprehensive plan. You're not going to hinder or discourage or adversely affect any of the surrounding properties. Um, and, uh, and the uh, pedestrian or vehicular traffic generated will not be hazardous or conflict with neighborhood traffic, which is the fourth criteria. I think the last point is during the planning board hearing, um, we, uh, we talked a little bit about how uh, to the extent that uh, you are, we are offering now these 296 slips in this basin, uh, boaters will have the opportunity to have boats on site rather than within dry storage facilities or off site or trailer their boats to a ramp. Uh, that will open up uh, boat slips in other facilities and will open up public uh, ramp spots uh, for boaters to have access at that at those areas as well. So there is a greater public benefit uh, to the extent that there are traffic impacts. You're, you're going to decrease people who live in Vivante from uh, trailering boats offsite. It'll, it'll relieve that little bit of uh, traffic from the general public road network. Um, but the main thing is you're going to allow boat access where people live so it's easy access. Uh, it opens up spaces in other facilities. Um, 
and uh, as we all know from from boat usage, um, uh, it's it's not as much as people are are saying. Uh, with that, I'll be available for any questions. But thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to point out, uh, and for the few seconds I'm I'm doing that, add that to the time of the applicant. You'll see on this slide it it, it makes mention to a proposed marina plan. This is not a marina. It is a docking facility, and under our codes, it cannot be used as a marina, which has a commercial connotation to it. So any mention of the word marina throughout the presentation um, is a misnomer. Just to conclude, I first would like to have Dan DeLisi uh, recognized as an expert witness by the council. Anybody opposed? No. Fine. Thank you. Just to uh, follow up, as you can see, we have a sea of blue here. Um, those are supporters of the Vivante project. Um, we have met our burden of meeting the criteria for the granting of a special exception. I think some of the most important points are by creating these docking facilities, you are opening up other boat ramp opportunities, docking facility opportunities at other locations, which is very important because we are constantly struggling with overcrowding of the boat ramps, waiting lists at boating facilities. In the city's own uh, cut through application, I was made aware of the fact that there was some finding that property values to the properties that would be benefited by that would, va would raise, and I think the number was $40,000 uh, or more per unit. That's a huge increase. Here, you're, pre you're, pre you're creating access that doesn't exist. So that number can only be higher, in my opinion, as to what the property values along this area uh, will increase. This project will take years to permit. It's my understanding from the city attorney that the city council cannot grant longer than a two-year special exception. But I'm telling you in advance, we will probably be back here asking for an extension of the special exception just because of the amount of permitting that we have to go through. It's a chicken and the egg. Did we come here first and get your approval and then go get all of our state and federal permits? Or did we go and get all those state and federal permits of years of permitting and come here and the city council say, eh, we don't think so. So we decided, Question. you're the chicken. We came here first. <laughs> uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, those that presented with us are happy to answer any questions. And I'd like to reserve some time for rebuttal uh, after the intervener's presentations. Thank you. Do we want to take questions now? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think so. Um, Rob, a qu couple quick questions, please. Um, with regard to the property that currently remains vacant at Vivanti, do you know what the plans are for building future buildings and how many and exactly where they're going to be located? Yes, there are plans to continue to build out condominiums there, um, and that's an important point. We cannot build any docks on the vacant land, right. so only those uh, lands that are currently developed would have docks on it, but there are plans for future development, and then those docks would go in. I don't have a number, but it would be in compliance with the zoning. And are they planning on building on the West Marion Court only, or the section that's also on West Marion Avenue? I believe their, their plans are to construct properties that they own, but I don't have any specifics on that. Okay. This special exception approval will authorize the use of the land for those docks, yeah. but those docks pursuant to the conditions of this special exception right. cannot be built until those up ones are developed. Right, I understood that part. I, I wanted I that for the record. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to get an idea if you knew when those lands were going to be developed because that is a significant amount of docks that cannot be put in until that happens. So I, I wanted to clarify that. I think, um, that, I think that's another chicken in the egg. Do you build them right. and then see about getting the docks? Or once you have the docks, um, I think that they're much more marketable, obviously. And another one of my questions was going to be the two-year thing. I, I, I find it, I mean, I, w I served on the Planning Commission for many years, and um, I, I don't know that you're going to be able to get this done in two years. Is there any flexibility on that, David? Not, no, but, but the City Council can consider an amendment to our zoning code that would allow for um, an extension to taking take into consideration environmental permitting, et cetera, but that amendment will have to take place. And perhaps, if the city council was interested, that amendment could be um, accomplished before there was a need to um, uh, renew this special exception in this case. I, I would just hate, if, if this does go forward, I would hate for them to have to come back mm -hmm. every 
couple of years and try right. to, because I mean, we all know what's going on with the Army Corps mm -hmm. right now with other projects. So I, I really can't believe that this is gonna happen in two years. And I just would like to save the time, the paperwork, the labor, and all of the things that go into it, if that's at all possible.